Good morning, East Africa, and welcome to your world. Now, this morning, we take a look at two issues impacting your world. First off, the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted many sectors of society, and the food manufacturing sector is one of them. Today, we highlight COVID-19 and the food safety environmental dilemma, as pointed out in the 2020 Tetra Park Index. In the second hour, we shall shift our focus on animals with special focus on how we can strengthen animal health provision. My name is Gladys Gashanja. Let's get down to business. Do you ever read the expiry date on the food packages you buy? That's part of a question we are asking today. Today we also shift the conversation later on to talk about veterinary services and who should seek their help no matter the animal you keep. Elsewhere, thousands of displaced people in Mozambique struggle to survive in Pemba Camp. Our assistance, namely on the medical front, hospitals and... And Red Cross trusts carrying medicines and medical equipment head to the Tigray region in Ethiopia. Thank you for joining us on this broadcast. As I mentioned in this hour, we focus on the COVID-19 and of course food safety and environmental dilemma. Now on that note, the question of the day to you is, do you ever check the expiry date on food items before you buy? And if not, why? Let us know that hashtag is a new normal on our social media handles and you can also reach us on the numbers at the bottom of your screen. But before we get to that conversation, let's take a look at the numbers in as far as the impact of COVID-19 around the world. And this morning, that number stands at 73,188,395 confirmed cases of COVID-19 globally. Out of that number, 51,322,512 have totally recovered. And unfortunately, 1,627,783 people have succumbed to COVID-19. In Kenya, that number stands at 92,055 confirmed cases of COVID-19. 73,452 have totally recovered from the same and 1,593 have unfortunately lost their lives to COVID-19. Remember, do take the necessary precautions, wear your mask, social distance and of course, wash your hands with soap and water regularly. Let's shift gears and uh, a look at some of the stories making headlines around the world. And a road trip through Libya's desert would long have sounded like a holiday in hell. But two months into a ceasefire, adventurous travelers are exploring the Sahara by four-wheel drive. Abdil Ahmed Mohammed, participant in the excursion, says the number of participants in internal tourism in the country is increasing. Before people used to visit us, that is Libya, to see the tourist sites which we are supposed to see before them now we used to get really happy when tourists would tell us that every young person has to go and see these sites and the mountains of akakas are a historic site that you can find in history books so the least we can do is visit and see it with our own eyes Some fashion and the 18th edition of the Dhaka Fashion Week hosts its main catwalk in a baobab forest in Senegal 
to maintain some social distancing. Adam Andiaye, a producer at the Dakar Fashion Week, says with COVID, we had to be creative, I had to find solutions, and above all, we had to avoid cancelling the show. We are there, we are in the middle, we are here, we are in the middle of nowhere, but the place is still great. For the first time also, we are doing pay for view so that everyone, I'm talking about the whole world, can see us. Now, more than 600 families live in an abandoned agricultural high school in Pemba, the capital of Cabo Delgado province. Many of them with recent memories of atrocities committed by jihadists who are sowing terror as they multiply their attacks in recent months in northern Mozambique. Patlomeo Muibo, the former administrator of Kwisanka uh, district, is among those displaced and living in the camp after fleeing his home in April. He acknowledged the government is struggling to meet everyone's needs, saying we have just the basics to survive, but it's not enough. The diet is an important component to ensure health and food security, especially for children. Charities offering humanitarian aid say they are working hard to ensure supplies reach those in need, but insecurity hampers access to some areas. Mozambique displaced people who fled a brutal Islamist insurgency in northern Mozambique says that they are now living like animals in a camp for eternally displaced people and that they are dying of hunger. For women and adolescent girls at the camp, life is a daily grind of chores, washing, cooking and caring for children. Usually we have uh, a few sectors that are regularly mentioned and are reflecting the needs on the ground. Uh, so clearly access to food, uh, water, clean water uh, is key, access to shelter, access to household items. These are really um, uh, sectors and the support that is regularly requested by uh, internally displaced persons. <laughs> Red Cross trucks carrying medicines and medical equipment leave Addis Ababa as they head to the Tigray region in Ethiopia to reinforce paralyzed healthcare facilities. According to the International Committee of the Red Cross, ICRC, the seven trucks have since arrived in Mekele, which makes the ICRC the first international aid convoy to reach the region since fighting broke out. Behind me are trucks loaded with uh, medical assistance but other required aid uh, for our teams on the ground to be distributed to local hospitals and primary healthcare centers. The contingents are basically those of the Ethiopian Red Cross and the ICRC and hoping that we get them as soon as possible to the health workers that really require this assistance as part of their action and contribution towards their communities. A lot of the social services that should be afforded to the local population is unfortunately hampered uh, and there we really need to step up uh, the assistance, the support to those vulnerable people, those who didn't choose to fight uh, and will still require our help, our assistance, namely on the medical front, hospitals and primary healthcare centers are seriously hampered in their delivery of services just because they don't have enough material uh, to cope with growing needs. The worst for uh, medical personnel, for the health staff in hospitals and primary healthcare centers is uh, to be uh, unable to help, is to be unable to provide support uh, due to lack of material, due to lack of assistance and to lack of stocks. And that's indeed what we're trying uh, and hoping to achieve by bringing much needed assistance into a region that saw a full lockdown since weeks now.
Back home and voting in today's by-election in Sambweni, Kwale County has begun. Remember, these by-election is actually being held because it rather following the death of Suleiman Dori eight months ago, who was the member of parliament of that uh, constituency. And we are now joined by my colleague, that is Kevin Mutai, who is in Kwale County with the latest. Kevin? Well, good morning, Gladys, and we are joining this broadcast live from Jogo Football Grounds here in Msambweni, which is a polling center uh, among the 129 that uh, have been allocated today for this uh, process to be undertaken. Right now, you can see that uh, voters, that are, those are registered voters, are currently on, in the queue uh, to cast their ballot and choose who will be the next representative in the National Assembly. We've not had any uh, incidents so far but what uh, we know is that security officials are in the area manning each and every corner of this uh, polling station to ensure security uh, of, of voters this particular uh, constituency has 69,003 registered voters distributed across uh, four wards that is uh, Gumbato Bongwe, Ramisi, uh, Ukunda and Kinondo but what we understand is that Gumbato Bongwe and Ukunda are at the main tallying centers with a majority of voters in this region and uh, just to say this Gladys is that with reports that we are currently collecting is that whoever will win uh, the two uh, the two uh, words that is uh, Gumbato Bongwe and uh, Okunda will definitely uh, get higher chances of securing this uh, seat and represent the uh, residents of Msambweni um, uh, in the August house so uh, we are on the ground and understand uh, that uh, uh, the candidates there are nine candidates who are battling it out uh, out in this particular race and as at yesterday though we had that according to the IEBC registered nine of them are uh, supposed to participate in this process but uh, one of the candidates decided to opt out yesterday and uh, for reasons that we have not uh, uh, you know we're not familiar with but uh, definitely these are the issues that we will uh, have to uh, get from the IEBC officials uh, as you can see that there is a particular clerk who has been designated in every polling center to ensure uh, that safety guidelines uh, with regards to COVID-19 is had adhered to and as of yesterday according to the returning officer who is in charge of the by-election he told us that there will be no voter who will be allowed in any uh, polling station within the region to uh, participate in uh, this process without wearing a face mask and ha I have confirmed that in most of the areas they have hand sanitizers and they're actually checking uh, body temperatures but let me just quickly uh, try and have a word with one uh, of the uh, voters here in um, Samweni to uh, get a feeling and understand what uh, uh, this uh, really means uh, to them kwanza kabisa ningeomba wanza kwa majina waitwa nani mimi kwa majina naitwa Juma Jennifer Obiga mimi ni mama mkaaji wa Ukunda nimepiga kura nimepiga kura polling station ya Mwakigwena E, tumeingia pale niliingia pale around uh, sakumi na moja na 45 by 6:10 uh, am tulikuwa nime tumewame tumeshakuwa kwa line and by 6:20 nilikuwa nimeshapiga kura yangu ba kabla tuja ingia tulichukuliwa body temperatures tulisanitizewa we had a 1.5 meter apart alafu everything was okay niliona everybody alikuwa kwa line yake kama ulikuwa na initial ya J ulikuwa kwa line ya J kama ulikuwa kwa initial ya M ulikuwa kwa initial ya M so everything was going on smoothly and uh, wale watu walikuwa naingia ndani walikuwa hawachukui muda mwingi walikuwa nachukua muda kiasi tu because uh, also wale watu walikuwa ndani wale officers walikuwa ndani they are very helpful to the people who are there they were, they were very quickly finding your names kama jina lako lilikuwa hakuna pale they had to take you wanakupeleka kwa line ile next station ambayo jina lako liko hebu niambie kama mkazi wa hapa uchaguzi huu mdogo una maana gani kwako uchaguzi huu mdogo una maana kwangu maana in fact msambweni we want a change na pia tunataka zile vitu ambazo marehemu dori aliacha we want them to go on because most of them naona zimesimama so we want them to go on that's why who chaguzi ninaona utakuwa maana kwangu things like bursaries watoto 
mambo kama ya siptali unaona we want them to go on that's why mimi nataka uchaguzi ni uko muhimu kwangu asante uh, gladys just before i hand it over back to you there are several people who are participating in this process just to uh, be on the lookout of any any other uh, uh, maybe uh, if there are any issues that will be uh, you know will pop up out of the uh, election process and here with me is uh, Hussein Khalid who uh, is an executive officer from the Haki Africa and they are part of uh, the people who are observing this particular uh, process and Khalid so far have you witnessed any incidences and perhaps what is your reflection uh, with the process so far? Um, so far we are seeing that uh, the IEBC is very well prepared uh, they have everything in order, all officials are there and everything is running smoothly. We've witnessed a minor scuffle here at Jogo polling station where a woman was trying to distribute masks and cause a bit of a disturbance, but she was dealt with uh, swiftly. Uh, we are also noticing a very low voter turnout. As you can see, uh, it's already it's just 7 o'clock and we have uh, streams that have absolutely no person uh, lining up to queue. So this is not a good indication. But then again, Kevin, as you know, by elections usually don't attract as many voters as general elections. But we are hoping that as time goes by, uh, voters will turn out. But yes, so far we've noted uh, low voter turnout. Thank you so much, Khalid. Thank we you. hope to talk to you much later. Uh, well, definitely, we'll, from here, we'll be uh, traversing the region just to uh, get a glimpse of what other polling stations are doing and the activities happening there. Uh, but uh, later in the day, we'll be assembling at uh, Dr. Babla Secondary School uh, that is here in Msambweni, which is the main tallying center. And Gladys, uh, I'm sure by, uh, you know, tonight, probably by 10 or even uh, some minutes past 10, uh, we'll probably uh, be in a position to know who... Uh, will be the next member of parliament here in Msambweni, uh, Kwale County after intense uh, political uh, political uh, gathering that has been going on uh, pitting different uh, you know political affiliations and candidates who are vying for this particular seat. So uh, that's it for now Gladys uh, and I uh, will be back with more. Thank you, Kevin Mutai, joining us from Sambweni Kwale County, where the constituency of more than 69,000 voters is set to elect an MP following the death of Suleiman Dori eight months ago. As Kevin mentioned, he will be transversing the constituency and giving us more details even as this by-election continues. Well, to something that gives us focus on today's conversation, at least in the first hour, ideally when shopping for your food you shouldn't be gambling with your health but as white alert showed us and read a lot before that not forgetting toxic flow the lapses in food safety safety abound so who is responsible for ensuring that the food on your plate doesn't cause you a slow and agonizing death and tv's olive barrow seeks to answer that question in this report she filed back in november of 2019 Mercury in your sugar, aflatoxins in your milk, your unga, and the cooking oil you use to cook your food. Not forgetting the SMS sodium metabisulfite found in your meat and the poison in your fruits and vegetables. This is Kenya and the parties responsible for ensuring that the food on your plate is safe would rather die than resign. But who should the outraged Kenyan demand for their head on a plate? If you find unsafe food in the market, whether it is meat, whether it is flour or any other food, it means the government systems have failed. And the systems in place involve at least 17 government agencies and departments and 27 different statutes. They are the Department of Public Health, the Government Chemist, the National Public Health Laboratories, Kemri, the Pharmacy and Poisons Board, the Department of Veterinary Services, the Department of Fisheries, the Pest Control Products Board, the Plant Health Inspectorate Services, the Agricultural Research Institute, the Horticultural Crops Development Authority, the Department of Crop Production, KEBS, the National Council for Science and Technology, the Dairy Board, the Coffee Board and the National Biosafety Authority all of which make up the National Food Safety Coordination Committee. But by the government's own admission, too many cooks in the kitchen spoil the broth. 
at the launch of the National Food Safety Policy in 2013. Then Health Cabinet Secretary James Masharia stated that the coordination mechanisms among these institutions is currently inadequate. This has created inefficiencies in the National Food Safety Control System, resulting in recurrence of food-related hazards, rejections of food shipments by importing countries, and other undesirable consequences. The proposed solution, a Kenya Food and Drug Authority that would provide for the regulation and management of food, drugs and chemical substances. That we have very good acts, but quite often we don't have regulations those acts. And that makes it very difficult to hold anybody Responsible. The government's commitment to the said regulation has been called into question. The Fresh Produce Consortium of Kenya CEO, Okisegere Ojepat, writing that initially the bill was to be presented jointly by the Ministries of Health and Agriculture as a government initiative. It was even announced as a fast-track bill by the President's office in December of 2018, only to disappear completely and then be replaced by a private member's bill without agreement or input from either ministry. Regardless, farmers, manufacturers and vendors do not operate in a vacuum. And as far as Professor Francis Mullah is concerned, the Kenya Bureau of Standards has a case to answer. Consistently caught flat-footed, he views them as being more concerned with saving face than strengthening the weaknesses in the farm-to-fork chain. They cannot consistently fail. And then, to make the matter worse, they basically jeopardize the whole economy. Olive Barrows, NTV. Definitely something that gives us food for thought, even as we delve into this conversation today. And to help us understand more by what we mean COVID-19 and the food safety environmental dilemma with me in studio is Jacqueline Kitoni Arao. She is the Operational Marketing Director at Tetra Park East Africa. Joining us also in the other studio is Boniface Mutata Muticia, who is a Processing Director at Tetra Park East Africa. Thank you for joining us on this conversation. And I think, first off, the first thing is the Tetra Park Index 2020 highlights COVID-19 and, as I mentioned, the food safety de environment dilemma. Mm -hmm. What is the connection between food safety and the environment? Um, thank you, Gladys. Thank you for allowing us to, you know, discuss this great topic. And food safety and environment are interlinked because food safety denotes what consumers are taking in and what consumers are taking in comes from the environment and the environment dictates the whole value chain what is safe what is unsafe how do we treat our food how do we transport it how do we store it so it's interlinked in regards to how it is all seen by the consumer uh-huh yes. and going by the report we just watched the question is who is responsible to ensure that what i pick from the shelves of our supermarket is safe for my consumption well um the Tetra Pak Index is uh, research or it's research based and mm -hmm. it comes from what co various consumers are saying globally. And what they are saying is that number one, the government is responsible for what they're taking. That is what they, they feel the government should be responsible for what they're taking. The second person to be who's responsible are the manufacturers. So consumers put very, very high ranking on manufacturers and their responsibility to us as the, as the general public and the consumers. And the third person uh, who is responsible are now the retailers. How do they store? How do they transport? And all that. So consumers really view government, manufacturers, re uh, retailers, all as responsible in this game. And following the retailers, they also say they are responsible themselves because the decisions they make are based on, you know, their knowledge, their engagement with brands, and they feel comfortable about that. Okay. Yeah. Let's bring in Boniface on this conversation. And uh, the question is, how has the pandemic underlined the importance of food safety? Uh, if I look at uh, food safety, basically, we are talking about uh, how safe is food, how hygienic is it for people to consume so that it doesn't make them sick. And uh, of course, COVID-19 has brought in uh, a lot of uh, challenges in terms of how do we handle food. So we, we look at uh, food safety and uh, the, the whole area about uh, what do, should we do about uh, uh, the food that we give to the people. In terms of uh, uh, environment, 
food safety is very key in terms of uh, the waste. How do we, the waste that we contribute from food is actually impacting on the food safety. If you look at uh, today's population, population is expected to grow by almost up to 9 billion by 2050. So how do we feed these people in a, in a more sustainable way? So the challenge is based, uh, how do we provide packaged food mm -hmm. and also make the environment uh, sustainable? And uh, as we talk about food safety, there's also a great relation with food security. Talk about that. Uh, if you look at uh, even Kenya, that uh, today if you go around the country, you find that uh, there's a lot of food growing up. But uh, is that food really, uh, does it end up, uh, does it feed the whole nation? If you look at uh, one, in, one out of nine people are starving in this world. So we need to be able to manage the whole supply chain from the farm all the way to the, to the consumer in a very sustainable way. And we need to be able to reduce the losses all the way from the supply chain because there's a lot of losses in food waste. Almost a third of the food that we, we, we produce actually goes to waste. Mm -hmm. So food security is all about looking at the total supply chain and how do we reduce uh, food, food waste and how do we make it safe for the consumer. And we'll understand more about food waste in a moment. And now, Jacqueline, the 2020 index points out that uh, COVID-19 has displaced the environment as the number one consumer concern. Why does the environment rank so highly for the consumer in the first place? You know, Gladys, <clears throat> if we don't take care of our environment, then there is no future for us. Mm -hmm. So as consumers, the, the, the younger consumers now understand that the value of the environment for us. So initially, um, it wasn't top, top in regards to, you know, their thinking, because there are many other things that happen around the world. But as younger consumers start noticing the things around them, they are noticing that they may not have a future, you know, a comfortable future if they do not take care of their environment. Mm -hmm. So as mindsets change, as education systems also change, then now the rank goes up because now they appreciate where they live, they appreciate what they consume, they appreciate the environment they are in, mm -hmm. and they want to take care of it. So, okay, yes. and this is where it also interlinks with food security, exactly. right? Exactly. Talk about that. So, um, in the report, when they talk about when consumers talk about food safety, they're not necessarily talking about nutrition. They're talking about food that is good for consumption and that is safe for them to actually take without any fear or worries that they're going to get sick, mm -hmm. especially this year. This year has exposed a lot of um, challenges and little things in consumer minds because they do not want to get sick. Getting sick is very expensive. Mm -hmm. Think about the general lady who is going to the market to sell her goods. If she falls sick, that means that she will not make money for the day and in return she will not be able to take care of her family. So when we were talking to these consumers, they were saying that food safety for them mm -hmm. is not just about nutrition, but it's about is what I'm taking good for me? Is it natural? Is it safe? Is it, you know, is it something that they can comfortably give their children? So that is where now the link comes in in regards to uh, food safety and then now how the environment plays in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're talking about safety and this word will come up a lot in this conversation. So how can manufacturers enhance food safety for the consumers, Boniface? Uh, I think uh, let's start uh, looking at uh, the trust. Uh, today the consumer comes in to buy their product from the supermarket. So they don't interact with the supply chain before the, they get the food in the supermarket. So there's a lot of trust that actually is, a trust is, uh, is given to the manufacturers to ensure that food is safe all the way from origin to the, food, to the consumer. So it's very key that the, co the, the manufacturers put in place quality measures and very high quality standards to ensure that the food that coming in is safe for the, for the people to consume. And uh, this of course comes in with the systems they put in place. Today, is no, uh, there's so many ways in which consumers can actually be, uh, uh, sorry, manufacturers can be able to ensure that the milk, if I talk about the milk, that they can ensure the milk they collect from the farm is of high quality. And this actually ensures that their product up to the market is very safe to be consumed by the consumers. Yeah. And definitely we know that stamp from the Kenya Bureau of Standards is very important. So mm -hmm. even as manufacturers are putting the product on the shelf, how do we ensure that even with the stamp, what we are putting on our plates is actually good for us? Uh, if you look at uh, expiry date, it's actually very vital for food safety. 
there must be a guideline on uh, food, on when to expire, how, when it's safe. But of course, today, uh, consumers go to the supermarket, they buy on, most of the consumers don't even check the expiry date. They buy on trust. They expect that they, there's a, a lot of trust by consumers, which uh, is actually supposed to be in the supply chain. So the retailers should be able to have done their due diligence, make sure that the product in the supermarket is actually uh, checked in terms of the expiry date. Uh, if I talk about uh, do consumers really discard food based on the expiry date, of course, the research is telling us that around 67% of the people, consumers actually discard the food based on expiry dates. And this is actually uh, seen differently ba based on the country. In uh, developed countries, consumers are a bit more flexible in terms of expiry dates. So if you look at Australia, about 40% of the consumers basically will consume food after the expiry date because maybe they have a lot of trust on the brand of the product. But if you look at countries like Nigeria, very highly dependent on uh, about 63% of the people mm -hmm. discard the food based on expiry date. So we need to be able to look at, uh, in terms of the legislation around uh, food safety, the, the government basically needs to be able to check this with a, it's a collaborative if, uh, effort between the manufacturers, the government, and the whole supply chain. Okay, and based on uh, those expiry dates, we had asked you on that question of the day is, do you ever pay attention to that expiry date on any food item before you buy it? And if not, why? Talk to us. That hashtag is new normal and we'll be sampling some of your feedback in a moment. And uh, Jackie, I was reading this something called intelligent best before labeling. What is that? So, intelligent based before labeling are um, a system that are being, um, ad, you know, in, in, uh, they're being put up in, you know, more developed countries where you have smart applications. So, f let me give an example of a box of milk, right? So, as a manufacturer, you have the capability of having a smart, uh, either a QR code or something like that, which when you input it into your fridge, it picks up in regards to what is the expiry date of this product, um, where did it come from, you can, tra traceability now comes in as well, and also it can tell how well stocked you are based on your consumption. So intelligent labeling is now the next level in regards to consumers owning um, their own, you know, journey of a product, uh, uh, product experience, mm -hmm. as well as manufacturers in exploring the traceability angle where they give uh, consumers full visibility of the whole product chain. Um, even now, the fun element, how do you engage with a product in, an, in a better way? You mm -hmm. know? Yes. Now, yes. I'm one of those people who will stand there and read through the contents of everything that I'm buying before yes. I put it on my <laughs> basket, including that expiry date. But uh, this expiry date and the labeling of the same has been said to also impact on food wastage what's the relation okay so as Boniface mentioned um, expiry date is also based on legislation country to by country by country as well as product now in cases where there is no element of trust within uh, consumers and the manufacturers or if it is sell by this time and you get rid of it um, and maybe it did not go through the proper process you find that a lot of food goes to waste so prod food that maybe should have been consumed earlier so looking at the value chain probably they would have taken it out faster mm -hmm. in the retail outlets they would have done you know fast in fast out kind of approach or seeing how manufacturers can also take charge and push out their products a bit more then now you know food waste but food waste is not just necessarily in regards to expiry dates mm -hmm. we're also seeing uh, food waste in regards to appearance let's look at vegetables or let's look at other things you'll see that if it does not meet my perception of how it should then I will not pick those apples in the supermarket or I'll not pick those bananas but what does that mean the retailer will have to discard them at some point. And if there's a way, you know, they could be able to be packed. Um, let's talk about different types of food as well. You can be able to keep them in a safe way that you can consume them at a later date. Mm -hmm. So uh, food waste comes out quite a bit mm -hmm. in regards to the whole process um, of, of, of consumption as well as process of consumer preference. Uh -huh. yeah. Now, are you like me where you always check that expiry date or you don't really care as long as the food is on the shelf, then the retailer must know it's good for you. 
talk to us. That hashtag is a new normal. If you can have that feedback on screen. Simon or Simeon Emerson says, I always do especially soft drinks and most of the time, especially for the takeaway type of drinks, they are irreparably uh, useless. Always confirm the expiry date again where refreshment costs less than the recommended price. Counter check 50 times. Well, Simeon is very, very aware of this. Benson Kagiri says, of course, especially for skincare products. Others like sodas usually write some faint dates you can barely read. I don't buy if the date is not legible. Interesting. Even Sogola says, yes, I usually dip egg in water to check the expiry. Wow, for a guy. That's interesting. <laughs> Quotes Dossio Doke says, I only check when it comes to bread. Okay. Uh, Ernest Langat says, I don't think salt, tea leaves, sugar, and much boxes have expiry dates. They are the only food I buy. The rest, kwagishagi. I hear you, Ernest. And body face, as you can hear from the feedback we are getting, most people, some really pay attention, some do not pay attention. The question is, if I consume something beyond the expiry date on the labeling, is it good for me? Uh, I, as I said, uh, expiry dates basically is a kind. Of, it's, it's supposed to be there as a, as a guideline on food safety. Otherwise, uh, you could be having food in the shelves that would be dangerous. But of course, whether the food is safe or not is something that the legislators have to check, plus the manufacturers. Because it, uh, if you look at uh, the product, there are people. The older people basically will look at the product, maybe also buy the product, check the smell. Uh, and we may decide to consume. But the younger generation basically will discard this, pro this product based on expiry date. So there's a lot of uh, uh, information and also communication that uh, manufacturers and the legislators and the government needs to do in terms of what is behind expiry dates. Because uh, we need to move uh, to what you're calling uh, intelligent expiry dates, where uh, you can be able to connect the whole chain, the whole supply chain from where the product is made mm -hmm. and uh, where it, when it was harvested, when it was processed. And this actually will be able to, to help consumers, even by scanning a QR code, to be able to get information about whether the product is safe or not. Yeah. This is the point where I need clarification on, okay? So the expiry date is a, a suggestion of when you should consume this. And of course, it keeps the retailers on guard in as far as how or what they're stocking on their shelves. But as a consumer, how many days after that expiry date should I consider the product a no-go zone? Uh, I would like to, to, to actually say that uh, it, it, it is uh, not something that you can actually say that uh, it is uh, this particular date because mm -hmm. there is a lot of science in, uh, based on different types of food and when it should be expired. But of course uh, now, because yes, you know that uh, if the labeling is not uh, basically helping the consumer to make a very good decision, then it, there should be a lot of collaboration, a lot of discussion between the stakeholders to actually relook re at uh, whether the expiry dates are really uh, good or are they really representative of when the food will go ex will expire. Uh -huh. yeah. Interesting. Now, with a clear connection between food safety and the environment, the need for eco-packaging is becoming a reality. Take a look. It's where we come from and where we will continue to go. Tetra Pak was founded on the idea that a package should save more than it costs. The paperboard was at the heart of the innovation and has always been a sustainable and renewable resource. And since then we've steadily increased renewable content in our packages by introducing new products, such as paper straws. We have replaced fossil-based plastics with renewable polymers derived from sugarcane, which are also used to produce caps, tops, straws and even the packaging material coating. Your products can proudly wear on-pack labels promoting the responsible sourcing of the materials we use to produce them. All of these features can be used together with the natural colour variations of the Tetra Pak craft packaging material. Combined, these sustainable solutions allow us to support you in achieving your environmental goals and increasing your brand value, both today and tomorrow.
All these packages are just as convenient and functional as ever. They're now simply more sustainable and more attractive. It's never been this easy or this rewarding to package foods and beverages sustainably. So transform your package and your business and capture the hearts of future generations of consumers. Clearly, Jackie, going by what Tetra Park is doing, the connection between food safety and the environment seems to come up again, over and over again, especially when it comes to packaging. Why is this so important? Okay, so I can talk about uh, Tetra Pak packaging because mm -hmm. that is what uh, we do. Yeah. Um, and in regards to our packaging, our paperboard comes from forests that are sustainably, um, you know, sourced. Uh, this is FSC, Forest Susti uh, Certified Council. And you'll notice that we strive to ensure that our entire value chain is supporting the environment. So the forests are well manned, our caps are plant-based, you know, coming from sugarcane um, or other um, uh, sources, plant-based sources. Mm -hmm. And we're just trying to ensure that the, the products that we bring out to the market are sustainable and we do not just ensure at that point alone, even afterwards, we are trying to now start up uh, recycling or we have started up recycling in Kenya and we have two recyclers currently and we, with the waste that we collect, we transform it into things that can be able to be used, uh, boards, uh, desks, chairs that we donate to schools. Um, so we try to make sure that whatever we bring out can also come back in a circular way. And Tetra Pak is all about supporting the environment and ensuring that whatever we bring out is, uh, is, is good. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, Boniface, definitely eco-friendly packaging is a welcome notion. How is the uptake by manufacturers? Uh, if you look at uh, today, the pressure is actually coming from the consumer. Consumer today, they are also looking at the environment because remember, the population is actually growing. But uh, the, the, the earth, surface is to still 20% or whatever is 20%. It's still going to become big. So manufacturers, of course, uh, are, are taking uh, care. They are looking at, uh, of course, uh, uh, sustainable packaging in terms of how can we be able to recycle this product and how convenient is it, you know? Because at, at the end of the day, once you, you put a product in the, in the pack, the only way to have, uh, you know, a renewable pack is either by fully recyclable to make other products like uh, what Jackie is talking about, the recyclers that we have in the, in, in, in the market mm -hmm. that are able to actually recycle the post-consumer uh, waste. But of course, as you know, the, the, the challenge is how to be able to collect uh, this waste. But of course, the uptake uh, is, is there by the manufacturers. They are looking actually to, to be able to address this climate uh, issue. Mm -hmm. with, uh, sustainable package yeah. and uh, the index actually highlighted the consumers uh, as you mentioned are very key on uh, looking at the way you're packaging the kind of packaging you're using how does this relate to the safety of the food or whatever is packaged inside uh, if I look at a uh, package first the, the purpose of a package basically is to be able to 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 protect the product that is inside mm -hmm. that and make sure that is actually be able to to maintain the product in terms of the value, in terms of the nutrition. Consumers today are also looking at uh, a package that can actually be able to, to, to last longer in terms of the contents. So are they, if you remember from the research, they also consumers saying that they are, they are looking actually, they will be able to pay a premium, almost 15% of the consumers surveyed, if the product is actually put, uh, is able to last longer. So there's a lot of drive in terms of uh, sustainability in terms of the product, long life, products actually coming into place. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, and uh, Jackie uh, Boniface has mentioned there's a challenge in recycling because of the collection of these waste. So what are you doing to ensure that you capture all the packaging that is put out into the market mm -hmm. back to the recycling? So it's a step-by-step -step initiative and it's something that we cannot be able to do alone as Tetra Pak. We need other players to support us as well. So I can just talk about um, this, the, the, the little steps that we are doing to make the bigger impact. So as a starting point, um, we, we worked with, uh, with two recyclers. There's uh, Chana 
industries and uh, there's Ramani industries. Now, these two recyclers work with waste collectors. Mm -hmm. So at this point in time, because consumers are now learning the, the angle of separating your waste, because at home, what do we all do? We put everything together. Mm -hmm. And with time, of course, we will be able to start separating and sorting and it will become easier. So what we are doing is we're working with different waste collectors who go to the sites and they're able to now put together this is the carton and then now they take it to the recyclers and then now that is converted into usable products there's also the other angle of uh, um, factory waste so our customers who produce there's always some element of waste here and there we also collect that and now take it to the recyclers as well but as i've mentioned it's a whole consumer mindset that has to be started right from the school levels i believe that schools should be taught about this is how you need to take care of your waste this is how you need to sort and then from there it will grow and develop because um, as we speak it's something that is a work in progress mm -hmm. and it'll take some time and it takes everyone now to develop this change uh -huh. and we're still asking you that question do you ever check that expiry date on your food items before you buy them hashtag new normal Achengo Perez says I do even salt. <laughs> okay, Aching. Uh, Dixon Dolo says that this question is not ap applicable to us. Ungaya kusaga in expiry date kweli. Good question, by the way. Collins Courier says, I don't check because I believe whatever has been displayed on the shelves are good, not expired. That is a lot of trust, yeah? Uh, Mark George Nyaosi says, I do check just to know within what span of time should I eat them and avoiding buying expired or about to expire products interesting we have Mohanya who says first thing I always do from painkillers to flour <laughs> well we hear you John Kamau says no because there is cabs wow look at another level of trust yeah Dan Ayodi says we use the natural ways we kunusa tu Inez <laughs> Boniface, as you had mentioned, uh, most people will do the smell test, and I mean the smell test. And yeah. if it's good to go, then we continue eating it until we no longer can stand yeah. <laughs> the smell. But uh, the question back to the manufacturer is, is there's some that say there is a cost that comes to this eco-friendly packaging. So they would rather hang on to the plastic that they know that we all know is not good for the environment. How do you now sensitize and start changing mindsets uh, in tandem to your goal as Tetra Park? Uh, for manufacturers, I think uh, there's, a very, uh, there's a trust that uh, is bestowed upon them by the consumer. Mm -hmm. So that uh, they sh apart from producing safe food, they should also be able to, to manage the recycling of this uh, uh, product. So in terms of uh, eco-friendly, it is the interest of uh, the manufacturers basically to start uh, communicating uh, these uh, benefits to the consumers in terms of what, what, what do they gain. Because today if you look at uh, uh, the process, the process uh, where we make food, customers today they are very much concerned about uh, waste of the packaging as well as the waste of the food. So they have uh, clear targets. They need to reduce this waste because it, uh, it impacts actually on their, on their, on their bottom line. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of interest for them to move to sustainable packaging because at the end of the day, if you are producing products and that's been consumed, you should also ensure that this product ends up not in the landfill, but either recycled into other products, that's what you call circular economy, or it managed in a way that you can actually be able to use that waste in a better way. And that is very good for the environment. Because today, remember, the environment is, uh, is, is actually struggling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's interesting that the pandemic has had major social economic impact with each buy literally putting a dent in the pocket of a consumer. Mm -hmm. So the question is, is it possible for manufacturers to produce products that last longer? Um, that is a yes because we're in the industry of protecting food and mm -hmm. making sure that food is available everywhere and it is safe. So um, I can talk in regards to food processing. Now, there are ways in which you can be able to make, um, you process the food, so you either heat, so let's look at long life milk, for mm -hmm. instance. Mm -hmm. It is not that um, it is go they go add chemicals, no. 
it is the process. So let's, let's, break, let's break this down. Let's make it simple. When you milk a cow at home, what do you first do? You boil the milk mm -hmm. in a sulfuria. Mm -hmm. So basically what you're doing is what the manufacturer is doing in a bigger scale. So he has a bigger sulfuria, so the tanks, and he will boil it to high temperatures mm -hmm. such that the bacteria in there um, go to sleep. So they're not activated. Remember bacteria in milk? Um, milk gets spoiled because of um, exposure to air and to oxygen and to light. Now, the Tetra Pak packaging uh, has a different layers that protect the product inside. So once it is processed in their septic um, technology, so that means it is from that tank, from their septic tank, from the heating, all that, all through to the packaging. It is not exposed to any of these, um, you know, external environments. Mm -hmm. And when it goes into the pack, it is sealed. That means that it will not be interfered with by any of those elements that I mentioned again. So the only time you will be able, the product will go bad, is the moment it is opened and then exposed mm -hmm. to now the oxygen and the air and now it will get bad. But when you, when you do that, when you heat treat a uh, food product, so either, you know, dairy, uh, whether it is juice, whether it is food food, um, and you pack it in the retort uh, format, so that is like the, 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 the tetra recut boxes, which are similar to the cans, you will find that you will be able to extend food uh, shelf life for a longer period of time, whether it is six months, one year, and some in some other food categories, even two years, you're able to extend that and you're able to provide food even in the farthest of places. If we look at East Africa, or even Africa in general, um, cold chain distribution is, is really not there. Um, and if it is there, you'll find that the retailers will either charge a premium or sometimes they even switch off the fridges at night. So they will only stock what they can sell for a particular day. So the moment you're able to offer food products in the long life format, then you're able to avail food even to the farthest of places and you're able to sort out the issue of um, your food, of hunger, of availability and uh, even for the manufacturers, they're able to actually have better profitability. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Boniface, it's interesting. The flip side to this is that there are people who are very keen on those long expiry dates. Like if a product says it will expire next year, they wonder how many chemicals are in there to ensure that it stays that long. But from what uh, Jackie is explaining, most often than not, that is not the case. So how do we change this mindset? I, I think, first of all, I would just like to, to reiterate, uh, or maybe just uh, for the viewers to know that Tetra Pak is not only about packaging. We also do uh, processing equipment. We also do uh, a lot of services to the equipment that we supply. So within the Tetra Pak, we supply end-to-end, -end, what you call end-to-end -end solutions to the food industry. And end-to-end -end means that the food that we supply is actually processed through high heat. And that is actually what makes the food safe. It's not by addition of uh, preservatives or anything, but uh, it's food that is actually uh, processed through high heat to kill the microorganism that actually can cause the disease. Mm -hmm. And I think this is where now the, 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 the <coughs> industry and the stakeholders need to be able to communicate to the consumers on the on the on this process of uh, long life. And actually, that is we are running a campaign on the same to be able to educate consumers that long life products are actually safe for consumption. Yeah. Interesting. Now, the first line defense, as we all know from contracting COVID-19, has been maintaining high standards, <coughs> excuse me, of hygiene. So what lessons can be drawn by manufacturers at a season such as this, Jackie? So uh, for the manufacturers, I think it's uh, about quality checks right right from the va from the ins from the source so if it is dairy when they collect that milk is it of good quality so that that's the first checkpoint they do a quality check so the manufacturer is taking ownership coming back now to the factories the entire process is it is it uh, are they using equipment that is of high quality are they using um the personnel have they been trained very well to ensure that they ensure that whatever is going through is mm -hmm. you know up to standards and following there now it goes to the to the distribution angle are they storing properly are they transporting it properly because there's also a lot of damage that happens during transportation so for the manufacturers it is about um, ensuring that they source good quality products 
products right from the farmers or from different source sites, then they ensure that through their production, they're able to maintain high, high quality um, uh, standards in regards to their operations and in regards to their equipment and how they maintain them and the staff. And then now to the other back end of the distribution element to the retailers and the consumers, they have to ensure that uh, whatever goes out goes out in a way that um, is good. So do not overstack, do not, you know, crunch up. Have you ever seen a pack that is always... Oh, yeah. Um, uh, to a consumer, <laughs> even from the research, they said that they do not consider that as a good product. They will think it's not so good. Mm -hmm. So it has to be managed right from the source site to the shelf so that the consumer receives a product that is looking good, that has gone through proper proper standards of processing and packaging and the initial product that was packed is of high quality okay yeah. and uh, as we mentioned over and over again is that the environment is at risk and the packaging of our food is playing a part in it so how, how can we strike the balance here boniface even as we bring this conversation to a close uh, <coughs> i think uh, first of all i think uh, just to mention that uh, a sustainable high performing package is a package that actually been sourced from uh, responsible uh, renewable material from you know from well managed forest and uh, that should be the starting point so at this package basically after it has been used uh, the product has been used it should be fully recyclable and when you talk about recyclable i think today we are looking at uh, being able to use this uh, as a raw materials for another for another industry to be able to make other products like uh, chairs like cardboards and all that so in terms of uh, re renewability, we need to now look at how do we move from just having a recyclable pack to a renewable pack. So these are the challenges of the future that we are looking at. A startup pack, actually, this is part of the research and development that uh, we are doing to look at, to address uh, a more sustainable, uh, convenient pack, as well as also to address the uh, climate issue. All right. Thank you for this information. Boniface Matata Mutisia, who is a, a processing director at Tetra Park East Africa. And of course, Jacqueline Kitoni Arao, who is the operational marketing director at Tetra Park East Africa. Thank you for schooling us on this one. And definitely that Tetra Park uh, Index 2020 is one that you need to look at because it has so much information and kind of opens up your mind in as far as how manufacturing is done and what is good for you. Food safety, definitely a fast thing. And of course, their relation to the environment and your food security. Thank you for joining us on this conversation. As I mentioned, in the next hour, we'll shift gears and we'll actually focus on the animal health service provision and how we can strengthen the same. Stay with us. Jama unangalia hapo unamdispise atiana form hey, shida Mungu alali kuna de utapatana na yeye ameomoka mbaya gari ni ile nono na life inamwendea fiti na wewe umechapa mako 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 do hivi jisort na umori mjenge life usije uka regret maze to get jisort na morio by vuma dial star 811 star 930 hash skiza nan nation at this time i want to as to paraphrase another text from the Holy testament and this is jeremiah chapter 33 verse 6 and it says that nevertheless i will bring earth and healing to it. He was referring to the city of Jerusalem, how it was polluted, how the evils had just crowded the skies and even the streets of Jerusalem. And says, I will heal my people and will let them enjoy abundant peace 
and security. So God is promising restoration of his people. And I want to give you this hope of restoration that amidst this coronavirus, God is going to heal his people. Are you, talk, are, you being, are you infected? Are you affected in one way or another as a family as I am talking to you today? God has promised that he will heal the land, this city. The cities of the world today are crying of COVID-19. But God is saying he will heal them and he will heal the people and let them enjoy abundance, peace and security. Up to the hottest morning show, Tina Kagia, the morning fix, Nation FM. Hey, how are you doing? I am Tina Kagia, aka the voice. And every single morning, starting from six up until ten, catch me on the morning fix on nine six point three Nation FM, where good music is. Let's have awesome conversations. Talk about life, love, money, politics, school, education. No topic is out of bounds. Mornings with Tina Kagia, Kagia. ninety six point three. Nothing but the best of conversations. Talk about your stories. Because honestly, it's important to unwind. See you every day. All of the hits with, with Tina Kagia. Kagia. The morning fix on Nation FM. Nation FM. Where good music lives. You haven't been my only love. And yes, excuse me for telling you, but my heart is divided and... And it's important that you know, isn't it? Just like you blamed me before my people, I'll blame you before my father. Because I won't be left yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, stop it. I promise to give you a very important post. And there, you can be yourself and not hide under the shadow of your father. I'm not a nobody. You are a daddy's boy and you're desperate enough to do anything just to keep your luxuries. Jaluwe na data statements Kujua vile bundles inatumika on Kenya's best network Dial star 544 hash and select check balance Kumbuka pia, the first time you access your data statements Una get 200 MBs completely free We are Nation Africa's independent media brand We are committed to empowering all Africans, from the young to the old, from the curious to the educated, and from the heart of the cities to the rural areas, we are nation. Join us, because if you want to get far, you do it together. Nation, empower Africa. Gotta go with Neptune. Thank you for staying with your world. My name is Gladys Gashanje. In this hour, we focus on strengthening of animal health service provision with the government and, of course, other players in this space. And uh, we will be joined on this conversation and already in studio by Dr. Vincent Olo, who is a veterinary surgeon at Brook East Africa. And also joining us <clears throat> in the other studio is Stephen Leshan Koye, who is a veterinary officer from Narrow County Government. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us and our conversation is focused as i said on strengthening of animal health services the question of the day to you is are you an animal owner could be pets cows sheep goats donkeys etc what are the challenges you face when seeking veterinary services 
let us know that hashtag new normal as we understand better about the service provision of the same. And speaking of which, livestock, uh, livestock farmers in Elgeo, Maraquet and Turkana counties are set to benefit from a vaccination program that targets to eradicate livestock diseases and improve agricultural produ production in the counties. Now speaking during the launch of livestock vaccination in November against East Coast fever in KU South, the principal secretary in the State Department of Livestock, Dr. Hariki Mutai, father said they aim to improve household incomes despite the climate change challenges to livestock farmers. Nuru Abdulaziz with more. Livestock farmers in El Goyo Maracuete are happy lot. This is due to the launch of livestock vaccination against East Coast fever and PPR diseases in Keio South sub counties. According to the Principal Secretary of State Department of Livestock, Dr. Hari Kimutai, the 18 million shillings vaccination program will help in improving the farmer's income. Mulikuwa mojaweka katika climate smart, mulikuwa mojaweka mamba ya mbuzi, nimeakisha kwamba nimelete 100,000 doses ya PPR vaccines. So kwa hivyo hiyo imeanza, nimelete leo, nimekuja nae, ni kama 10,000, na itendea kuja zingina 10,000, 10,000, paka ifike 100,000. Mana nielewa? Kwa sababu sasa tuanza kuchunga mbuzi wakati ile miradi ngine na kuja, tusipata ile mbuzi kwa mba hiko goi goi. Elgeo Maraquet County Governor Alex Tolgoz thanked the World Bank for funding the program under the Kenya Climate Change Smart Agricultural Program. Elsewhere in Trukana West, animal mass vaccination is ongoing in five wards of Letea, Nanam, Songot, Ekolo, Beye and Lapur targeting 100,000 animals, both small and big. This is in collaboration between Locado, a local NGO in Trukana West, and the Trukana County government following the community outcry over the increased number of animal deaths. <laughs> Wizi kidoko kalasini, hile mkuba arubaini. Wakati ya kukufa, nyama yaka nakuwa yolo. Tasa na shiguru le watu, hamekuja na mkupatia nini dewa. Hapo mbeleni, isi mifugo silikuwa sinakufa kwa wingi. Na kenye ilikuwa imeleta hiyo kitu, ninadhani ni mzige hile ambayo ilikuwa imeleta. According to Dr. Sang John, the main disease affecting the animals is PPR and foot rot as a result of the heavy rains pounding across the county. Iyo gonjo wa PPR, kuna malengo ama there is a global strategy to eradicate PPR from livestock and it's a 15 year project. Kenya is part of the global program to eradicate PPR. And uh, in a kusudiwa ya kuwa, by the year 2027-2030, PPR itakuwa imekuwa eliminated kama, kama, kama vile rinderpest ilifanyika. More often, animals in arid and semi-arid zones feed on dry pasture, but when they feed on green pasture, they tend to fall sick and eventually die. Nuru Abdul Aziz, NTV. Gives us perspective on our conversation of the day. We are talking about strengthening of animal health service. Dr. Law, why is this important? Actually, it's very important. Thank you very much, Gladys, for having me in the show. Strengthening of animal health delivery system is very important because animal welfare determines human welfare. And so one of them straight away looking at it from the public health concern whereby how do we well keep our animals? And straight away from the, the short clip that we just saw, you see most of actually human diseases, an aspect known as zoonosis, up to 60% of diseases that you find in humans actually come from animals. And that's how important it is to strengthen service, service delivery, especially in relation to veterinary matters. As you do that, you're also protecting human welfare at the same time. Mm -hmm. yes, yeah. Now, Dr. Law is mentioning animal welfare. Stephen, you're an advocate of the same. So for those who look at animals as just a source of food or, uh, you know, um, a source of income, why is it important to safeguard the welfare of animals? Thank you very much, Gladys, for having us here today to talk about uh, our veterinary service delivery. 
Uh, and I would like to say that uh, animal welfare is becoming very key for the health of the animal and also for our own health. Uh, right now, we all realize that uh, the environment, animals, and also humans are quite intertwined. And so if an animal is not uh, uh, given the freedoms that uh, it needs uh, on animal welfare, then it means we'll also be affected. So these animal welfare freedoms uh, include freedom from dust of an animal, uh, freedom from uh, injury and disease, uh, freedom to also be able to uh, behave in its natural tendencies. And so if we deny an animal some of these freedoms that um, are, uh, cater for their welfare, then it means we'll also be affected. Uh, poor uh, catered for animal will definitely translate to uh, poor meat on our table, poor milk on our, uh, on our table. And also, it also means that uh, even our values are quite affected because if we do not value the welfare of the animals, there is a likelihood that we also don't value the, we don't value, uh, uh, the welfare or even our, of our colleagues, brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. And uh, you also focus on uh, animal husbandry. I think the last time I had this word was when I was taking agriculture in high school. Could you give us a refresher course on the same? Okay, thank you very much, Gladys. So, uh, since devolution, of course, the counties, uh, the functions of uh, livestock and agriculture were uh, almost devolved 100%, mm -hmm. except, of course, for research, training, and regulation of the profession. Uh, most of the other functions were devolved, and one of those functions was animal husbandry animal welfare. Uh, we also have the public health component of veterinary that is also a function of the county governments. And so that's part of the mandate of the, of the county governments to offer proper animal husbandry. And that involves the general taking care of uh, the animal from its feeding to disease control and also to achieve better products from this particular animal. So animal husbandry generally is taking care of the animals from, uh, from the farm level to all the way to where you get your products. Mm -hmm. Now, Dr. Olo, what are the gaps in Kenya when it comes to veterinary services and the uptake of the same? Just to take you a bit back into the history of veterinary service provision in the country. In the before pre-independence time and in the early 80s, the government basically provided veterinary services free to the people of Kenya. But uh, in the mid-80s and 90s, due to the structural adjustment programs, the World Bank could not continue funding these programs for the government. And so some functions, and one of them is the veterinary service provision, especially day-to-day -day treatment of your animal. These are some of the functions that the government privatized. Mm -hmm. So as we talk now, the day-to-day -day treatment of your animals is a private good, basically is a private service. And so the government, li like my colleague has just said, remained with other aspects of like regulations, issues of policy, but the treatment and service delivery is in the hands of the private sector. And so this also caused in a lot of growth of private entrepreneurs into the industry. And so we have a lot of private service providers, private vets, mm -hmm. private animal health assistants, and also brought in a, a market, especially of the market of selling drugs through the shops known as the agrovets. So the, the gap that came in is that the government withdrew from delivering those services to farmers mm -hmm. and so it's upon the farmer to demand the service. So it becomes a private good and the farmer has to demand for it and pay for it. So what we are doing at the Brook East Africa and in relation to the work that we do the government is to strengthen those services because they are, we've identified their gaps within the provision of the veterinary services. So we are working very closely with the government to strengthen them. And of course, a big bulk of the service provision, veterinary service work, is done by the private practitioners. As uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Leshan, will tell you that the government is very lean on staff. So most of the service provision is done by private vets and HS. And so what we do at the Brook East Africa, and especially the work that we do on equine uh, welfare, is to try and bridge that gap that we've identified, especially with the service providers from the training colleges, whereby uh, some of them are not very well trained on issues equine welfare, on e issues equine medicine. So with our trainings, we come in to bridge that gap. And also, so we do a lot of training of these service providers out 
and also mentoring them. So basically what we do at the Brook East Africa, we, don't, we are not having a parallel system with the government. We are basically supporting what the government is doing, especially those gaps that have been identified in relation to service provision. Uh -huh. yeah. Capacity building. Exactly. Okay, now in an area like Narrow County where animals make a huge, huge percentage of the residents' livelihood, how is the uptake of these veterinary services? Thank you, Gladys. Uh, I would like to say that um, I've had the privilege of working for Noro County government before devolution and still working for Noro County government after devolution. And uh, I can say there is a very big improvement because since the county governments came in, um, we, of course, had a number of uh, veterinary practitioners who were also employed by the county government, uh, despite the fact that the county government has also inherited a workforce from the veterinary that was uh, retiring. So there has been quite an improvement, and we've also been working very closely with uh, a number of partners with different interests uh, in livestock. So I think our strength uh, that actually that, that is improving on veterinary uh, provision services in, uh, at the county level is our ability to work with the partners very well. And so we're trying to bridge the gap of uh, uh, the, the, the not enough uh, veterinary staff. So the uptake as of now is, is quite good. It's improving. We are still not at the optimum, but uh, we are getting there. Okay. And still on the uptake of veterinary services, how can we enhance the same doctor law across the country? And are there particular areas in the country where you can say there are red flags in as far as uptake of these services? Of course, the country is divided into agricultural eco zones whereby you have the high potential high agriculture areas that is high producing areas and also we have the low areas especially the arid and semi-arid areas like uh, where we have a lot of pastoralists and where a lot of beef production is is done from and mm -hmm. so we need to strengthen all this because among other issues that i'd like to talk about are the aspects of our uh, antimicrobial resistance about two, three weeks ago, the world was celebrating issues of antimicrobial resistance, which is a big challenge. And that's also how what we do ties quite well with that. Because remember, I told you, like one vet, unlike a human doctor, if one vet misuses one antibiotic, say in a poultry of a thousand chicken, and he puts in the wrong antibiotic there, you can imagine how many people will be exposed to that either through consuming those eggs or through consuming the meat. And so our work also addresses other aspects like uh, the AMR, which are now a global issue, mm -hmm. trying to see how to reduce aspects of excess use of antibiotics into animals that actually goes on to get even to the human population. Mm -hmm. And yes. are there zones in these uh, regions you talk about that uh, you are concerned more about? Yes, especially in in high producing areas uh, where we have a lot of intensive agriculture production, mm -hmm. especially in those areas like, we're talking about Nairobi here, especially the areas surrounding Kiambu, like the farmers that are in Kiambu, because this is also brought about by the pressure to produce. Mm -hmm. And so, especially those areas around the urban area, due to pressure to produce to supply the market, you have, we tend to get that a lot of things like excessive use of antibiotics, mm -hmm. either growth promoters. And like if you go down deep into the rural areas like the rural areas like Masailand or that, whereby there's no much demand to produce and so there's no much pressure for farmers to bring animals up to speed mm -hmm. due to demand of the, the market is demanding from them to produce more. Mm -hmm. So some of these challenges are also looked into in relation to where they are. So high producing areas, high agriculture producing areas have proved that they have a bigger challenge, especially on aspects of service provision mm -hmm. and also what farmers are accessing to do what they are not supposed to do. All right. Now, appealing to your public health background, Stephen, animal health points not only to the sustenance of these animals, as you mentioned, but also translates to the health of, of the consumers. So do the communities make the connection and how can you enhance sensitization of the same? Thank you, Gladys. So uh, in, in the public health aspect, of course, we begin with uh, sensitizing the communities in terms of, uh, like Dr. Ari has mentioned, that we have also a lot of uh, AMR components in, uh, as part of our public health. Um, uh, farmers are using uh, antibiotics indiscriminately, mostly because they, might, they are not accessing uh, proper veterinary services. But also we follow up uh, their products also as meat inspection, where we also carry out the public health function. 
and uh, we sensitizing the farmers plus the public as well uh, in, in terms of public health, how to do the, how to use uh, or how not to use those antimicrobials without a professional prescription. And uh, uh, as products also, we are sensitizing the consumers together with the retailers and almost everybody at the value chain. Uh, there are programs that are actually meant to uh, help from transportation, production, uh, all the way to the, to the, to the fork. That's where we, 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 how we sensitize the public and the farmers on public health. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of these regions, especially like Narrow County, are vast and uh, with uh, pastoralists moving with their animals, how are you able to ensure that you reach, reach out to all these animal owners? Yeah, that's uh, a challenge actually in most uh, pastoralist areas because of the vastness of the counties and how these uh, pastoralists move from one place to the other. Uh, but so far, with a number of uh, private practitioners around uh, uh, those areas who complement the government services as well, we've been able to reach uh, very far places. And uh, we've also trying to practice a lot of prevention rather than uh, curative. So we've been doing a lot of preventive medicine, carrying out uh, proper vaccinations, doing a lot of extension services for the farmers mm -hmm. so that we are, we, are, we are able to make these animals healthy, even though we might not be able to reach all the corners of these pastoralist areas. Okay, now I'll, I wonder how we are doing as a country and as far as the number of vets is concerned. You talked about capacity building, but uh, going by the need in the country and the number of vets, how is that equation looking like? Of course, uh, when you talk about uh, the number of vets and the need in the country, what is needed, we have about 3,000 veterinary surgeons in Kenya, mm -hmm. but we have another three or four times of the same of the other cadres, that is the animal health service technicians, whether have certificate or diploma holders. And so the ratio is still quite small in relation to the number of animals that we have around. And uh, so we find that most of the service provision is actually the frontline worker is actually the animal health assistance. But of course, the way the regulations are, they work with the support of the veterinarians. And so true, we still, the workforce is still less mm -hmm. because in the country we only have two veterinary schools, that is the University of Nairobi Veterinary School, and we have another one upcoming in Egerton University. Mm -hmm. And then we have a number of mid-level colleges that trains the other cadres of animal health technicians. So the number is still low, and that's why even at the Brook, what we do also, we do a lot of work with the, especially the veterinary professional regulators like the Kenya Veterinary Board to ensure that the, these animal health training institutions, the courses that they're offering are, are of quality. And so we engage with them at the curriculum level whereby we input into their curriculum and also support the implementation of the same to ensure that the graduate that is coming from those veterinary training colleges is well trained and able to meet the demand of the market of the Kenyan farmer mm -hmm. so that the, the Kenyan farmer can get the value for his money when these people come to treat the animals. Okay, yeah. and remember we asked you earlier, are you an animal owner and uh, what are the challenges you face when accessing veterinary services? You can talk to us on that hashtag new normal on our social media handles and also you can text in with your feedback as well. So, in this case, what is the role of county governments in supporting veterinary services, especially in your county, Stephen? Yeah, thank you very much. Like I mentioned earlier, the functions that are supposed to be carried out uh, by the county governments, we mentioned animal welfare, we mentioned animal husbandry, we mentioned public health component, and we also mentioned uh, disease control. Of, uh, those are the mandates of the county governments. So on disease control, the county governments have been carrying out uh, regular vaccinations on uh, some of the common diseases that are reported in, in livestock. And uh, it also depends on the particular counties because there are diseases that are prone to other counties and other diseases are prone to other counties. So uh, we've been doing that on disease control. We're also doing market inspection routes. We really try to also control uh, animal movement by issuing uh, sanitary documents such as uh, movement permits. And uh, we're also doing a lot of routine surveillance on a quarterly basis where we just go and collect the samples, have them tested in the veterinary investigation laboratories. And so on the public health component, we've had a uh, meat inspection uh, that is going on also. 
and on animal husbandry, we are carrying out a lot of extension services that are helping the farmers uh, carry out better husbandry. So together with the uh, partners, the county governments are actually uh, engaging together, coming on board. And even with issues to do with the uh, public health, we are coming together with other departments uh, to form uh, or rather to follow the One Health concept where we are able to come together and uh, report these diseases uh, for human, for animals, report on the events and we respond together as a team together with the environmentalists as well. Okay and uh, Dr. Olo, Brook East Africa has an eye of the East African region. Are there countries that are doing better than us or does Kenya rank first when it comes to these services? Of course within the East Africa region we could actually say Kenya ranks first and you're actually right that Brook East Africa works beyond the boundaries of this country. And because uh, the welfare issues that we address in equines cuts across just the way my colleague have talked about, even the diseases, diseases and animals majorly knows no boundaries. And so within the East African region, apart from working in Kenya, we also have programs in Southern Sudan. And we also have programs in Somaliland. And also programs partly in Uganda and also in Tanzania. But of course, the model is the same. In all these Afri East African countries, veterinary service provision is a private good. And so the owners have to pay for the service that is rendered. But of course, we are ranking a bit higher because uh, we have good training institutions mm -hmm. and uh, our vets still, you find them working across all those regions. In those countries, we also have Kenyan vets, Kenyan trained vets working across the border. So I would say we are still doing well, mm -hmm. but you still, we still also have challenges within the country that needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. yes. Now, Stephen, the cost of veterinary services has been cited as a huge deterrent to excess of the same. How can this be mitigated? Yeah, it's true that the cost of uh, veterinary services, especially in high-producing animals, is, is quite high. And also, there are a number of farmers who might not be able to afford these services. But uh, there are modalities that uh, might uh, uh, apparently help in uh, reducing the cost, especially if you all practice uh, very good animal welfare and preventive medicine, so that because the, the expense is mostly when we are doing treatments of some of these conditions or carrying out surgeries of some of these conditions. Mm -hmm. So uh, the most important thing is we carry out, we start from animal welfare doing that preventive medicine, and I think we will lower our cost of production. And then, of course, we will commercialize our, our, farm, our farming systems so that we are able to get enough money to do the treatments and also still make profits from our production systems. All right, we take a short break on your world. We'll be back even as we speak more on strengthening of animal health services in this country. Stay with us. Kagiza sasa na mshumaa wa sumo. Mshumaa wa sumo umetengenezo kwa bidhaa bora zaidi na unakufaa wakati wote. Kila mara unapoaza kuhusu mwangaza katika nyumba yako waza mshumaa wa sumo. Unachomeka pole pole bila kumwagika mwagika na hauishi haraka, hauna moshi wala harufu. Jipatie mshumaa wa sumo katika duka lililo karibu nawe kwa bei nafu. Kwa maelezo zaidi, tembelea afisi zetu katika barabara ya Ndume Road, mkabla na Lunga Lunga Road nyuma ya Carton Manufacturer karibu na stage ya matatu ya Sinai. Unaweza pia wasiliana nasi kupitia 0722575619 au 0736028181 ni mshumaa wa sumo kando kutoka Rock Industries Limited did you know did you know at Ruruma at a factory you can open an account and leap up pole pole at your convenience did you know at Ruruma Bate Factory you can get customized sizes according to your roof plan to avoid wastage? Did you know Ruruma Bate Factory offers free delivery countrywide within 72 hours? To order, call us now on 0111 050 700. Ruruma Bate Factory, Mali Safi, Kwa Bay Poa. Jaza, jaza, kwa sababu, there's a hooping, one million bob to be won. 
all you have to do ni kupiga shopping worth 1500 and above na uko ndani ya draw <laughs> christi ibambe na quick mart quick mart fresh and easy maji mdosi wangu ametupa simu yangu ndani ya maji mdosi wako uko sawa venye nikaacha ameniambia ameniambia ajui na akimpigia simu ashiki hai guy For the women who deserve more, Moped is now in Kenya and more than 40 countries with its nylon free surface. New Moped has unique softness and up to 100% protection. Your skin will love it. Banji koko ameamua ku join dance ya chini kwa chini. Kibe. Yaani jiko sawa sote. Wameamua kupunguza bei. Chini kwa chini, chini kwa chini, chini kwa chini, chini kwa chini, chini kwa chini. Okoa Krisi na Banji Kokoa Banji Kokoa Jiko asidi ya Kenya Backfinder from the BBC Death threats and distress Nigerian man whose photo is used in a fake post claiming that he had contracted coronavirus speaks out In terms when I'm moving around I shed tears Even that night I was shedding tears to my wife I was like Don't worry, calm down I believe that God will see you through was this Tanzanian superstar almost stabbed at a concert? We tell you this is fake or fact. Did Venezuelan president urge women to have six children? <laughs> false. <laughs> false. <laughs> we'll find out in true or false. Every spoonful of Nutri comes loaded with the necessary vitamins, protein and minerals for you and your family to become healthier and stronger. Pick up a pack today from your nearest store. Nutri. Every spoonful counts. When you gotta go, you gotta go with Neptune. Thank you for staying with NTV. My name is Gladys Gashanja. You are watching Your World. And in this hour, we're focusing on strengthening of animal health service provision. And still in studio with me, Dr. Vincent Olo, who is a veterinary surgeon at Brook East Africa, and Stephen Leshan Koye in the other studio, who is a veterinary officer from Narrow County Government. Gentlemen, thank you for staying with us. Before we get back to that conversation, let's look at the other world. And an Iranian goods train carrying tons of agriculture cultural products chugged into a western Afghan province as the two countries mark the opening of their first shared railway network. The train route so far links the Iranian city of Kaf with the Afghan town of Rozanak about 150 kilometers away but is scheduled to be expanded to reach Herat, Afghanistan's third largest city. Crowds of Afghans gathered at Rozanak station for the arrival of the first blue painted train. The project was a gateway to Europe for Afghanistan, said our Iranian President Hassan Rouhani, and the development, security and stability of, of Afghanistan contributes to development, security and stability in Iran and the entire region. Indonesia held nationwide regional elections Wednesday with more than 100 million voters eligible to cast a ballot despite warnings that the poll would worsen the nation's COVID-19 crisis. The archipelago of nearly 270 million, the world's third biggest democracy and fourth most populous nation, delayed the vote originally set for September as it struggled to contain soaring infection rates. From the capital Jakarta to the holiday 
island of Bali. Polling station staff in full protective gear and posts social distancing and took voters temperatures before polls closed. Daniel Ominto lost his job and then his home when the coronavirus pandemic sent the Philippines into lockdown. Now he and his family, along with hundreds of others, live on the street, relying on food handouts to survive. I believe that the hunger has affected us severely to the point that even those with homes that are living already in that desperate mode, would come and ask food from us. We are doing 1,100 today. And uh, I don't know until when, hopefully, I would like to hope that we could uh, provide until Christmas or January. After January, that would be a huge challenge for us. But uh, definitely, it will rise. Thousands of people defied public gathering restrictions to descend on a small village in central Sri Lanka for syrup that a self-styled holy man claimed could prevent and treat coronavirus. Now, the country has been experiencing a surge in cases since October, with the number of infections increasing more than eightfold since then to over 20,500 and 142 dead. Carpenter Damika Bandara claimed on national television last week that a so-called cure had been revealed to him by a god. But doctors in the island nation said there was no scientific basis for the syrup and there is no known cure for COVID-19. Now, photographs of the health minister published in local newspapers drinking the concoction helped spread Bandara's claim. <laughs> Three-month-old Yemeni twins Al Hassan and Al Hussein suffer from acute malnutrition, weighing only two kilograms. Divorced, unemployed, and without any income, their mother Fula Mohammed struggles to feed them along with her other seven children. The malnourished twins are being treated at the Yemen Swedish Hospital, which receives more than 20 acute malnutrition cases daily from the Taiz province. Doctors in the hospital say that they get support from international organizations but if funds fall short the hospital might have to shut its doors to hundreds of malnourished children in Taez. Now war in Yemen is in imminent danger of the worst famine the world has seen in decades uh, according to the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres. <laughs> Now, this Massachusetts church, which has created controversial na nativity scenes in the past, reveals a pandemic-inspired scene this year. Each year we try to depict some, some way that it kind of captures what our current world looks like. And we thought that this year, with all of the above going on, that this sort of brings a lot of things together. The, the masks on the figures is COVID. That's probably the biggest thing this year in terms of um, it's affecting the entire world, and it's something which doesn't discriminate against rich, poor, migrant, immigrant, uh, it's religions, faith, nationalities, it affects all of us. And peace is only really found in, in community, and community is where you find love. So it seems like it's kind of a lot to kind of can put into one stable but it seems as if uh, the peace us together with love seem to kind of capture not only, not only the spirit of what Jesus gives to us and brings anew into the world every day, but it's the one thread that can possibly hold us all together at this time when we seem to be in a million different pieces. What would seem to be so simple as wearing a mask, it's become a political hut, you know, um, hotbed. Mm -hmm. and it's what some people see as a sign of caring and compassion others might see as a sign of infringing on their rights and it's a, just a simple gesture we, we take we have to take care of each other
Back to our conversation of the day as we understand how to strengthen animal health services in this country. And we had asked you, are you an animal owner? And what are the challenges you face when you are accessing or trying to access veterinary services? And we have that feedback coming through. We have Palmers who says exorbitant fees, drugs, and a time uh, times plain incompetence. Interesting. Uh, Mrs. Ernst. Einstein says no payment plans which is important because vets are very expensive some will claim to give you a plan but when you get there no plan at all women shrugging and some vets have no idea what they are doing okay we hear you Rotich says in Nandi County I'm happy to say they respond on time well done uh, Jackson says, I haven't reached a point where I need a veterinary service for my pets and animals I thank God I think you should Every other time we'll hear that from the vets themselves. Kwanzaa, where can I get cats uh, vet in CBD? Help my cat is sick and I'm very worried. All right, we shall answer that question. Is this the last one? All right, then. And uh, interesting there. Let's start off with the cost of it. I mean, I think that has come up over and over again, Dr. Olo. Yes, yeah. The cost, uh, there are several uh, factors that actually would make pet owners and farmers feel that veterinary cost is very high. But uh, I don't think it is that high as they claim because there are also other things that come into play. And uh, so if you look even into one of the, even the drug, the, the veterinary medicine supply chain, mm -hmm. because uh, most of these drugs are actually internationally produced and are brought into the country. And so it is not expensive, but uh, what we are saying is that for you also to reduce this, there are also practices that you need to do. And that's why you're saying that, just like in human medicine, we're now pr promoting and asking people to do a lot of preventative medicine, mm -hmm. whereby you are looking at just the husbandry practices like what my colleague Dr. Leshan talked about, just issues about feed your animal well, look at the hygiene, and if we do all this, and then other aspects like vaccination, so that if, if it's dairy animals, you're doing a lot of hard health, so that you are preventing most of these conditions before they occur. <clears throat> because basically we don't, most of all conditions that occur, especially the clinical cases, be it in livestock, be it in cow cyst, cause fever, the common disease, it has a preventive aspect to it. And so the farmer always has something that they can do before they call in a vet. And so the best person to take care of your animal is yourself. Mm -hmm. Of course, the vet comes in only when the vet has to come in. But uh, I don't foresee a case where you have a farm and every day the vet is driving in to treat East Coast fever, East Coast fever, East Coast fever. It means there's something you're not doing well. So one way is also to improve on our husbandry practices of how we take care of animals. But of us of course, also looking into the government, there are also bills and there are policies that the government can also do to try and subsidize the veterinary services. And that's why even at the Brook, East Africa, we are also working very close with the government. And especially the other day, we are supporting the enactment of bills, like we have the public health bill, mm -hmm. where we are supporting the government do that, the animal health bill, the animal welfare and protection bill, and the livestock bill. So these bills will also create a conducive environment mm -hmm. and also help reduce some of this, especially reducing onto the inputs that, are, that vets will use. But of course, uh, you cannot talk about aspects of uh, cost. And uh, of course, people say tell you cheap is expensive. Mm -hmm. And uh, even in the veterinary line, there are also aspects of quacks. People who pretend and assume to be vets, yet they are not vets. And uh, so it's also upon the farmer to know whether this is a vet or not a vet. And that's why we have the Kenya Veterinary Board that regulates the veterinary profession. And even at the Brook, we also work with them very closely to ensure that the person that is intervening when your animal is sick is actually a vet. Because those are also the challenges, like I've seen some of the feedback that is being given over is that mm. also the vets are not available. I like to show them the vets are available. If you go into the Kenya Veterinary Board's website, mm -hmm. you see the list of accredited vets 
every year we have the list there and so you can be sure that whoever is taking care of your pets or your animals is a qualified vet so that you are getting value for money mm -hmm. yes. now Stephen, there was feedback there somebody who says that so far they thank god that uh, their pets have not had the need to see a vet how often should you see a vet is it like us even if you're not feeling well you can go for some checkup to just check everything is okay or do you only see a vet when it's necessary Thank you very much. I think for pets, there are regular checkups that uh, people take their animals to the clinics for either checkups, dental checkups, or even uh, other parameters. Uh, but for animal health, for the livestock now, the food animals, there are hard health programs that farmers carry out. Like I'm a vet, I'm supposed to visit a farm and just identify what needs to be worked on, what needs to be improved, how far are we in terms of our management uh, in the herd. So. Yes, you might always need a vet even before your animals actually fall sick. Okay, I know you are from Narrow County, but you've worked in this space for a while. There's somebody who was saying they are here in Nairobi and have no idea where to take their cat. Help us. Yeah, the, the truth also is uh, most uh, pet owners or, or even livestock owners do not utilize veterinary services and especially the government veterinary services because you're supposed to visit these services. They are open 24 hours. The contacts are there. Just ask them, where can I get a vet? And from there, you'll be recommended either to a private vet or if, if a government vet is also available, he'll be able to attend to your animals. So as much as um, they're, they're not getting the vets by themselves, it's also true that they're not uh, utilizing these uh, government offices that are available. And even in CBD here, there are veterinary offices. Okay. Mm -hmm. And maybe, Dr. Olo, you can reiterate where you can get a list or a database of all the qualified vets. Yes, exactly. The, the way I said earlier, veterinary profession is regulated by the Kenya Veterinary Board. Mm -hmm. And so if you check on the website of the Kenya Veterinary Board, you'll get the list of accredited vets qualified. But of course, as my colleague have just said, that uh, in this country we have veterinary offices all over the country, and including even Nairobi. And so like uh, that uh, Kenyan who just asked where he can get veterinary services, the first point that I would like to refer them is that there's a Nairobi veterinary office that he could get into that place. And once he gets, once he gets there, then they'll be able to help him identify the vets that practice around. Because mm -hmm. remember I said at the beginning that veterinary services are private good. So we have a lot of private vets and vet veterinarians running private clinics mm -hmm. or even doing their own what you call ambulatory home, to home visit. So he could visit the website, the Kenya Veterinary Board website, and get their list of vets and their contacts. Or he could also visit, visit the local veterinary office within Nairobi, which they are also distributed all over then. He should mm -hmm. be able to get a vet to help him through with this problem. Okay, now even as we bring this conversation to a close, realization of successful and quality delivery of last mile veterinary services to all animals is heavily reliant on that public-private partnership engagement. How and how have you been pursuing the same? We're pursuing the same on the realization that uh, there are gaps within the government delivery system. And that's why as Brook East Africa, we've come in with the support that we give them so that to ensure that there's that last mile delivery of veterinary services. And of course, we appreciate the fact that, that the delivery of those services are done by those animal health assistants, but with the supervision of the vets. And so we bring in that Brook, being a welfare charity organization, collaborates closely with the government departments like, like the NAROC government, county government where my, my colleague comes from, and then now together with the private service providers on the ground because the last mile delivery is actually done by those private vets mm -hmm. around because even the government, they only have the lean staff, which is mainly administration. Mm -hmm. So that's how Brook East Africa as a welfare charity comes in, working very, very closely with the government, but of course together with the private service providers on the ground. Mm -hmm. and, that. and Stephen, with your experience at the county, how can other counties probably draw a lesson or two from where you sit and also how can we enhance these services across the country? Okay, thank you. Uh, the truth is, in this country, we have a challenge in of shortage of staff or professionals in almost every sector. And veterinary is not an exception, even though I think we are slightly more affected because for a number of years, veterinary officers were not, uh, were not uh, employed. 
So we're still agitating very much to the county governments and also the national government to employ more vets, which will also help, of course, reduce the cost of delivering those services to the farmers and the pet owners as well. So that's one way. And also working together with the partners has been a very big success for Naro County. Uh, we've been able to actually do all, almost all the activities on a 50-50 representation. So if it is Brook East Africa working together with FSK, uh, we work together throughout. We involve them in our activities. They involve us in their activities. With the private practitioners, now we are working together like uh, we, are, we are a team. And on our reporting of diseases, we've also worked together with the health uh, sector. And uh, we are having representation all the way to the ground where we report diseases of all kinds. So working together with the partners and uh, obviously employing uh, more vets so that we're able to reach further places will go uh, very far in helping us uh, deliver proper veterinary services. Okay, and uh, gentlemen, this has been a very informative conversation. Dr. Law, you always say the best part of your job is the satisfaction that your interventions are able to reduce the suffering of animals and bringing a lasting change to the lives of the animals and the people who keep them. How can we sustain this as a country? How can we? Sorry? How can we sustain this as a country going forward? The only way to sustain this as a country and among the things that we do also among our programs is actually working very closely with the community, the animal owners. Mm -hmm. And not only the animal owners, but even other stakeholders, like including even you, the media, putting these aspects and even like this program mm -hmm. that's sensitizing the people about issues about animals. So that is one of them. At the Brook East Africa, among the programs that we have is that we also have school programs with the school going children at the primary school level whereby we are instilling these aspects of animal welfare, good animal welfare practices at the primary level so that they grow with this idea in their mind because basically people think that animal welfare aspects are some uh, something from Europe. Mm -hmm. It's not African to take yeah. over animals but if you look very well traditionally our forefathers took better care of the animals. And so it's a lot of work at the engagement with the community. And I'm going to say it is not only the animal owners, but all the other stakeholders that we need to come into this. Of course, we also look at the aspects of issues of policy, enabling environment so that all this is also anchored into policy. But of course, in Kenya, we have very good policies. The only challenge will be on the aspects of implementation mm -hmm. so that as we make more policies and as we review the policies that we have, we are also enforcing and strengthening the aspects of implementation of those policies that will help us get milestones into the animal welfare work. Mm -hmm. yeah. Dr. Vincent Olo, veterinary surgeon, Brook East Africa, and Stephen Leshan Koye, veterinary officer, Naro County Government. Thank you, gentlemen, for helping us understand this conversation much better on strengthening of animal health service provision in this country. Before I bid you farewell, a quick reminder tomorrow we shall be seeing you same time on your world as we take time to appreciate our brothers, sisters, and uh, brothers and sisters keepers during this season that we are in remember it's been a difficult year for all of us but i'm sure you can pinpoint one or two people that have literally held your hand through it all so take time to appreciate them even as we mention them tomorrow on your world see you then find independence by training them in fish farm. Oh, it's dear. tough on my back, joints, and can cause headaches. Panadol Extra relieves multiple types of pain.
If symptoms persist, seek medical advice. With the Stay Soft Refill, saving money is as easy as snip, pour, mix with water and shake. Stay Soft Refill. It's 2 litres of Stay Soft for up to 30% less. Go Ahead is believing to make each day a brighter day. It is our faith to start all over again. Go Ahead is never giving up in the face of adversity. To go ahead, now that is the Cajun spirit. great things in life you must do little things every day like the one two three with Colgate do the one two three with Colgate and give yourself a future to smell about came to tell me that she doesn't care if there's anything between us. She's still planning to get close to you. What? A lot of people care about you. I don't need any that's help. I can deal with this, no, okay? that's not true at all. What's wrong with you? Are you drunk or what? I'm telling you, Coyote sent more immigrants and we have no place to put them. I saw that girl. She was walking around with the at the park. Oh, give me a break. You're hopeless, Berta. I swear I'm telling you the truth, Juan. Go back to the party and find this girl you're talking about. Enjoy Christmas fantastic offers with Hisense. From smart Android TVs with Bluetooth and a warranty of two years to fridges and newly introduced chest freezers with a five-year compressor warranty. Hurry to get one today till stocks last. Financing institutions in the education sector. How can formal financial service players help in the rebound post COVID? How can the cash flows be strengthened amidst an uncertain business environment? Can the banking sector design products tailored to meet the needs of a disrupted learning environment? In the next edition of Business Redefined, we interview the head of SME and agribusiness at KCB for this and more. We are Nation, Africa's independent media brand. We are committed to empowering all Africans, from the young to the old, from the curious to the educated, and from the heart of the cities to the rural areas, we are nation. Join us, because if you want to get far, you do it together. Nation, empower Africa. TV turning on your world. The following program has been rated GE. It is therefore suitable for general family viewing.